Hey, well, Hill Country, good morning. So excited that you're here and any visitors that are joining us online. I'm just thankful for the opportunity to be able to bring the word to you this morning, but I'm also just thankful for the opportunity that we have, even in the midst of all this craziness, to be able to gather, uh, that we can't be stopped uh, gathering together, though it may not be in the way that we would prefer. Um, certainly joining together as a family in person is preferable, um, but really with your families today and in your apartment by yourself, wherever you are, I just pray that God's blessing would be upon you, that His Word uh, would have its way in your life. So we've been working through this series that change is coming, and man, we never saw this coming. Like, it was coming, and we didn't even know it. But what we do know is that God knew it. Um, he knew that this was coming, and I can't help but think and realize that He was actually using this series to prepare us for this difficulty, these changes. So we've gone through several messages. We've looked at what does it look like to cling to love? What's it look like to cling to truth, to cling to Jesus, and to cling to Jesus' promises? So this morning, I just want to start out by asking you a simple question. How are you doing? Like, how are you doing clinging to these things? How are you doing with all of the, the upset that is, this has caused? Many of you uh, find yourself as homeschool parents, and you never wanted to be a homeschool parent. Many of you find your normal homeschool routine wrecked because your spouse is now there all the time. Many of you who are introverts now find yourself in constant contact with a group of people that you would normally say, oh man, I love these people. But because of the amount of time that you're sp spending with them, it's getting a little difficult to cling to love. You know the truth, but it's getting a little difficult to cling to truth. You know that Jesus is involved, but man, it's hard to cling to his promises. Well, today I hope what we really see in this last message out of John chapter 17 is an amazing truth and an amazing picture of Jesus. And what did Jesus cling to? I really had a difficult time this week putting this message together, mainly because of this working analogy or metaphor of clinging. And I thought, well, okay, there's a lot in this passage. You could cling to unity. You could cling to prayer. This passage is full of mission. You could cling to mission. But then, as I'm reading it for probably, I don't know, the 15th, 20th time, it just hits me, well, what is Jesus clinging to? What is it that Jesus, in this last hours of his life, as he spent this time with his disciples and shared a meal with them, and now he's headed to the Garden of Gethsemane, what is he praying? What is he holding on to? So if you have your Bible, uh, we're going to be in John chapter 17 this morning, and you can open it up there, and I really want to encourage you, um, even though there may be some of the passages on the screen, like, get a copy of the Bible. Now's the time to be underlining, highlighting, even if it's on your phone. You use that, keep it in, in front of you, and, and really search the scriptures uh, for yourself. So we're going to look at John chapter 17, just starting in verse 1, and we see that when Jesus has spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Man, what an incredible truth. I glorify you on earth, having accomplished your work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So in this just little first section here, we see Jesus. And what is he doing? What is he clinging to? He's clinging to the Father. He's calling on his name. 
Jesus, God in the flesh, the third person of the Trinity, needs the Father. He clings to the Father. Like we should take this as an example in our own life and also take comfort in it. He's calling on the Father's name. We know he did this on a regular basis. You might remember in Luke uh, 6.12 that Jesus, this is Jesus that's talking about. He says, in these days he went out into the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. All night long. Jesus was praying, seeking the Father, calling on his name. Now let me just ask you a question that I, I really already know the answer to. Do you think if Jesus needed help holding on, that you need help? That I need help? Remember, these are, this is hours before Jesus is going to go to the cross to pay the payment for yours and mine's sin, to be separated from God the Father so that He can pay for our sins, to be nailed to the cross, and He's calling on God's name. Now what, what is He holding on to as He calls on God's name is just this picture of actually accomplishing God's work. He's accomplishing God's work. It says in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus, who though being the very form of God, that he didn't count equality with God something to be grasped. He, he was God himself, but he didn't count it to be held on to. Man, you can't cling to something if you're holding on too tightly to something else, can you? Jesus, he didn't cling to all the rights, all the privileges, all the power of being in heaven with the Father seated at his right hand. He let that go for you and I. He emptied himself by taking the very form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. See, this is the first part of Jesus accomplishing the Father's will. He left heaven. He came to earth. Man, this is incredible. He let go of all of that so he could cling to the Father and accomplish his work. And we are so thankful, each of us, that he did this. We see in the passage that he accomplished the Father's work here by giving us, giving the disciples, eternal life. He says that you've given me all authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you've given me. And then he describes it. Well, what is eternal life? And this is eternal life, that they may know you, Father, that these people that I've been with, that they would know you. Remember, they've been slow on the uptick so far. They have doubted and wondered and not understood. They've been confused and distracted. They haven't known what to hold on to, but now they're getting it. And he says, hey, like you've given me these people and I've given them eternal life that they would know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. And I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Man, what a, a powerful picture of what Jesus is holding on to, is to accomplish the work of the Father. I wonder what that looks like for you in your life, for me in my life. That I would hold on to what actually God has called me to do, created me to do. We know that we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he's prepared in advance for us. Ephesians chapter 2. But how do you cling to that? What, what might you be holding on to that's stopping you from clinging to that? Maybe it's relationships. And now that relationships are really kind of taken away, like you're just, you're not sure what to grasp for. You're like the, the child in the pool that, I remember as a, a young boy, I was swimming with a, a group of kids at the, the boys club. And I, I use the word swimming lightly because I didn't know how to swim. I was in the pool with a bunch of guys. And a ball that we were playing with went over in the deep end. And I went, hey, hey, I got it. 
You know, I didn't want anybody to know that I couldn't swim, and I thought it was just on the edge. And before I knew it, man, I was over my head. And I was, with all that I could, I, I was trying to get up out of the water, and there was no help. There was nothing to grasp hold of there. And then all of a sudden, thankfully, a lifeguard jumped in, saved me, pulled me up out of the water. There was something physical to cling to. Well, I think that in our time right now, we can feel like there's not much to cling to. But God's actually given us so much to cling to. God the Father's given us work to accomplish just like Jesus. The last thing we see is just that Jesus was clinging to the Father by returning to Him and bringing glory. It says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. He, he's accomplished the work that God has given him, and he's going to return uh, to him. Therefore, it says in Philippians 2, that God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name, so that in the name of Jesus that every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Man, Jesus returning to his Father is a sign of accomplishing his will and bringing glory to God. So as Jesus goes on in this prayer, he, he has prayed for himself. Now he turns his attention to praying for his disciples that are, have been with him for three years. His, his 12 or really 11, we're going to find out that it turns out to be. But these are the, the people that have been the most intimate with him, that have spent the most time uh, with him. And he says that how do, how do they cling to the Father? What does it look like for them to hold on? This is the disciples cling to the Father by believing that Jesus came from the Father. You can't cling unless you believe. Rocket science right there for you. You can't cling unless you believe. You know, if you don't trust, you don't really hold on. You know, it's that picture back to the pool of, you know, the, the child that has so excitedly jumped into his father's arms time and time and time again. You know, just, Daddy, do it again. He takes him out and sets him on the side and he jumps. But then maybe the father has missed him a couple of times and he's no longer willing to jump or he's a little bit scared. When our youngest son, James, was a, a small boy, we were out at the lake with a bunch of friends. And uh, he was in uh, one of those inner tubes that you put on. It goes around you and you float. You stick your feet down in it, made for a baby. And he was with some friends and I had gotten out of the lake and it was just on the, the beach and I was having a conversation with someone else there. And I looked back and all I could see was James's little feet up in the air. He had flipped over and no one had noticed. He was, he was head underwater and his feet were kicking for all that they were worth. And let me tell you, James had a different level of trust after that. He wasn't just willing to jump into anybody's arms after that. And sometimes I think we can be the same way because of circumstances and situations in the world. And we, we go, okay, God, I believe, but Help me believe that Mark chapter 9. I have faith, Lord. Help me with my unbelief. But we see that the disciples, it says in verse 6, Jesus is talking and he says, I've manifested your name to the people whom you've given me out of the world. Yours they were and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. And now they know everything that is given to me is from you. They believe. It says, For I have given them your word that you gave me, and they've received it, and they've come to know the truth that I have come from you, and that they believe that you sent me. You see, the very first part of clinging for the disciples here was believing. It's the first part of it for us as well that we have to believe that Jesus came from the Father. And specifically, 
that he came from the Father for you and I. It's so much easier to cling when you really trust what you're clinging to, isn't it? So we see that in the, the disciples here. But we also see that they received the word of God and they kept the word of God. They're, they're clinging to the Father by receiving his word and keeping his word. There's this deal of, of knowing and obeying that is at play here that's going to work. And we see the disciples put this into practice and begin to really be able to hold on to the Father, hold on to these truths. This is that in verse 8, it says, For I have given them your word that you gave me, and they have received it, and they've come to know the truth that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. They've taken in God's word, and they've received it. What about you? I don't know where you are this morning in this process. Maybe you've been around a lot of Christians. Maybe you are a Christian, or, or maybe you're just seeking. But you can't cling to what you have not received. That's an important fact for us this morning. And for those of us who've placed our faith in Christ alone for the forgiveness of sins, we need to know that the Father is trustworthy and we can cling to Him, that He will not let us go. So as we look at the disciples again, we see just this picture that they, they cling from believing that Jesus came from the Father, receiving and keeping God's word, but then really resting in his protection. Jesus says, I'm praying for them, verse 9. And I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you've given me. For they are yours, and all that is mine is yours, and all that is yours is mine. And I'm glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you. So Jesus is going to be leaving them. He's coming to the Father. He says, I've been there with them. I've been protecting them. But God, now I need you to protect them. He says, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Man, isn't that amazing? Jesus' prayer for us is that the Father would keep us. And how would he keep us? that we would be one, as closely one as Jesus and the Father. Now, I have a lot of friends, some closer than others, a few much closer than others, but I have one friend and my wife that she's the closest that I have. But this picture of Jesus and the Father, he says, I want them to be as close, Father, as you and I are. I want them to be one with us. That is an amazing uh, thing that he's trying to get across to us. And while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me, and I've guarded them. And not one was lost except the son of destruction. That's a reference to Judas, who he knows is going to betray him in the next few hours. So the son of destruction is lost so that the scriptures will be fulfilled. Don't miss these little things in this text that I just don't have time to reinforce, but it's the scripture that's true. It's the scripture that tells us the truth, that gives us the picture of how to live, gives us a picture of the faithfulness of God, the steadfast love of the Lord. And it says, hey, you, you predicted this. And Judas needed to fall away that the scriptures would be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy in themselves. I have given them your word. Again, he, you see this repetition of the word that God's given them. Jesus has given them the word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. So there's a separation here between the world and those who believe, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. 
You may be familiar with the Lord's Prayer in uh, Matthew chapter 6 or or Luke uh, 18, where it says, lead us not into temptation. I always thought, well, that's a strange thing to pray. Why would you pray, hey, God, don't lead us into temptation. Why would God lead you into temptation? Well, I think this is the same um, practical truth that's, that's being displayed here is that, man, we are tempted we're tempted to fall away. We're tempted to go our own way. You, you will remember um, that even Peter here in a couple of hours is going to deny Jesus. But if you remember with me in, in Luke, I believe it's 22, it says Jesus is talking to Peter and he says, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you, but I've prayed for you. Peter doesn't even know that he's going to be messed with. He doesn't even know that he's in a battle. But God says, hey, Peter, I know. Jesus says, I know. I'm praying for you that you would be able to resist this temptation, that you wouldn't fall away. And we know that Jesus did deny, or Peter did deny Jesus, but we also know that he didn't fall away forever, that Jesus brought him back in. So we see just this picture that in receiving and resting in the protection of God is so important that God is going to keep us from the evil one. And that's important, that that we have an enemy and God is going to keep us from the enemy. He's going to help us to be faithful. He's going to help us to cling to the Father. Lastly here in just this section, you just see that the disciples cling to the Father by living like Jesus. In verse 17, it says, sanctify them. The word sanctify means just, you know, set apart um, for something special. Like, Lord, would you use them? Would you help them to be holy? Um, Sanctify them in your truth. Well, what's truth? Your word is truth. Again, just this emphasis on the word of God. And as you sent me into the world, so I send them into the world. Here it is. This is the living like Jesus peace. Father, you sent me from heaven where I, it was perfect. I was seated at, your, seated at your right hand. I had all the glory and honor that I was ever needed. But Lord, I left there, came to earth. You sent me here to accomplish your will. And now, God, I send them. We have to realize that to really and truly be able to be clinging to the Father, we have to be willing to live like Jesus. And we see this in the life of the disciples. I have a little map here for you for all those uh, map geeky folks, uh, Jeff Benton. Um, but you see, this is a map of where the disciples were in the world when they died. Isn't it pretty amazing? Like they really spread out. They really were all around the known world. They were sent out from him. It's because of them that this next section of scripture actually comes alive for us. So Jesus is praying. He continues on and he says, hey, I don't ask only for these. In other words, not just these 11 or just these disciples that are here right now, Father, but I also ask for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be, they may all be one just as you, Father, are one in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe, that the world may believe that you sent me. God, would you show them? Would you manifest yourself? So we see that This is the prayer for us that we move to. This is the prayer where Jesus has transitioned to praying for himself, to praying for his disciples, and now praying for us. So how do we cling? How do we cling to the Father? Well, we cling to the Father by remembering that we're one. Man, so God, just like you and Jesus are one and You, Jesus, and the disciples are one. You want us to be one just like that? That's what he says. He says that they 
may be, they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. Now, this idea of being one, it, it's, it's huge. It's the idea of unity in, with the Father and the Son, but it's also unity on mission. We're, we're unified in what we're doing, what we're about. It's also uh, unity that we, all of us, believers together, that we would all unite and recognize, hey, that we're part of something huge. Man, it's easy to cling to something that's sturdy, isn't it? Ever thought of, you know, clinging to something that, that felt real flimsy or, or real weak? I remember one time when I was a, a kid and I was in my friend's backyard and we were uh, playing like Tarzan and we were jumping from branch to branch. And there was one branch and it was a shaky branch. It was a shady branch. It was an old branch. And I said, hey, I bet you you won't jump out and grab that branch. And he did. Man, my father would say, anyway, he jumped out and he went to grab this branch and you know what happened. It broke right in half and his feet went up higher than his head and he slammed to the ground. Well, why did that happen? Because what he jumped to wasn't sturdy. It, it wasn't able to hold his weight. But we have to remember that what we're clinging to, this unity, this thing that God has created, the church, a family, it can be cling to. It can be clung to, I guess is the right word. That we can hold on to each other in it as we love one another. That's what we see next is that we cling to the Father as we display the Father's love that we would display the Father's love. The, the glory, verse 22, it says that you've given me, I've given them. Now that's amazing, isn't it? That God has given you and I the same glory that he gave Jesus. Or Jesus has given us that glory. He says, the glory that you gave me, I've given them. This idea of glory here is Certainly, we're not trying to say that we're equal to, to Jesus or equal to God the Father in all of that He is, but He's saying, hey, I've set you apart. I've sanctified you. I want to glorify you so that you look so different. You display the love of God in a way that people recognize God the Father in it. So He's given us this glory he goes on and says that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. So not just one, but perfectly one. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you've loved me. So as we display the love of God to each other, the world is going to know. That's what it looks like to be perfectly one. Remember Jesus leaving heaven, coming to earth, living as a man, letting go of all that he could have held on to with the Father there so that he could be a servant, so that he could serve you and I so that he could accomplish the will of the Father. Well, when we live this way, we're actually clinging to a truth that displays the Father's love. As we hold on to the Father, we don't just want to hold on by ourselves. Uh-uh. We want everybody to hold on to him. We want them to know that God can handle them. I remember one time when the kids were young, uh, Tina and I went to... Uh, at sea world or six flags or something like that and so all of my kids had to have been between the ages of eight and newborn because we had all five of them and i know we had them in five kids in an eight-year span i think if i got that wrong forgive me tina but we're at you know sea world or six flags wherever it was it was hot and they all just gave out 
Like they all couldn't walk any further. They couldn't go on any longer. They were tired. They were just ready to quit. And I had all of them. I was pushing some of them in a stroller. I had some of them in a backpack. I had one of those weird little things that, you know, you wear across your front that hold them. And I just, I had them all. And it really honestly wasn't all that difficult to have all five kids on me at one time in some way, shape, or form. And I just got to tell you, I love that picture because it just shows me or reminds me of the Father's love for the world and how for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that all who would come to Him, believe, shouldn't perish but have eternal life. That God, when we display His love, the Father's love, the whole world can cling to Him. He can hold us all, but we know that all won't. But He could hold them all. Lastly, we see that just say, rest in the truth. The truth that the Father's holding us. So, this is huge. It's not, it's not about your strength, you know? It's not about holding on for as long as you can. And maybe you've seen these competitions where people are, are holding a bar for however long they can, but finally their grip just gives out. Or the ninja warrior competition where they're going and you're thinking, man, how long can they hold on to that? And finally they just give out. We don't have to worry about that, you and I. It's actually the Father that's holding on to us. So, so maybe you haven't done such a great job clinging to love. Maybe you haven't done such a great job of clinging to truth. Maybe this week just got crazy on you, and you just couldn't cope any longer. You couldn't put up with any more, and you lost your temper, or you found yourself on some Netflix series for the, you know, streaming it for hours and hours and hours upon hours. You just were lost in it. And you go, okay, wait. But it's not about you holding on to God. It's not you about holding on to God's love as much as it is. It's about God holding on to you. We see this in the last section here. He says, Father, I desire that they also whom you've given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you have loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world doesn't know you, I know you, Jesus says, I know you, and these know you, that you have sent me. They know you have sent me. I've made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me is in them and I in them. You see, family, brothers and sisters, those who are listening, those who feel like they've come to the end of the rope, they can no longer hold on. They've done everything possible to hold on. God wants us to know that he's actually holding on to us, that we can rest in the fact that God has us securely in his grasp. We can let go with confidence and fall graciously, lovingly, gently into the arms of the Father. I will continue to make known the love with which you love me. How much do you think the Father loved the Son? It's the same love that He has for you and I. In the midst of all your trials, in the midst of all that's going on with the COVID-19, jobs being lost, people in situations that they never thought that they would find themselves, can't find anything in the grocery store that you want. You know, hand sanitizer used to be plentiful and now it's nowhere. God says, hey, I want you to know that I hold you. I hold you. So as you look to cling, cling to the Father. But just know that as a child clings to you, and maybe you can relate to this, maybe you have kids, maybe you don't, but maybe you've probably seen it. There's a point where a child just crawls up on you and he just holds on for all that he's got. He just wants to get as close as he can or she can. But then maybe 15, 20 minutes, depending upon the time of day, after they've squirmed as much as they can, they just fall asleep. And they're no longer clinging to you. You are clinging to them. God is clinging 
to us. Thank you.